Welcome. My name is Amy Brady, and I am Orion's executive director and publisher. Uh, I am so pleased that you are joining Orion and the National Audubon Society today to celebrate Orion's latest anthology, Spark Birds. Our guests today will be in conversation about their contributions to this anthology and perhaps even their own Spark Birds. But first, allow me to tell you a little bit more about this beautiful book and Orion. This handsomely designed hardcover book gathers some of the best essays and poems about birds to appear in Orion uh, in our 40 years of publishing. And in the spirit of trees that provide birds shelter, this book was printed as gently as possible on 100% post-consumer waste paper without chlorine and without plastic. The book is introduced by Jonathan Franzen, and it was co-edited by Franzen and Orion Editor-at-Large, Christopher Cox. It includes work by luminaries such as J. Drew Lanham, Mary Oliver, Sandra Steingraber, and of course, Elizabeth Colbert and Emily Rabiteau, who are joining us today, and many, many more. This stunning cover and the feather art throughout the book is by artist Chris Maynard. A big, big thank you to the Carter Dalton Quinn Charitable Trust for making this book possible. If you enjoy this conversation today, you are going to love the book Spark Birds, which you can purchase uh, at the link that I'm going to put now in the chat. And if you love birds and good environmental writing in general, then you will love Orion Magazine. Founded in 1982, Orion has remained an independent quarterly magazine that seeks to bring readers into a community of caring for the planet. As a thank you for joining us today, I'd love to offer you 20% off a one-year subscription to the magazine, which you can also find at a link in the chat. And now is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce today's guests. Just as I remember my own personal spark bird, which was the Northern Mockingbird, by the way, I remember the first time I encountered writing by Elizabeth Colbert and Emily Rabiteau. Both writers have helped me and countless other readers to better understand how the climate crisis and other environmental concerns are reshaping life on our planet and our connections to all living things, including our avian friends. Elizabeth Colbert has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1999. Her essays have also appeared in The New York Times Magazine, Vogue, and Mother Jones, and have been anthologized in The Best American Science and Nature Writing and The Best American Political Writing. Elizabeth won the Pulitzer Prize for her 2014 book, The Sixth Extinction, and her more recent book, Under a White Sky, was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Time Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, and many others. I am also very proud to say that she is an advisor for Orion. Joining Elizabeth is Emily Rabiteau, whose stunning essay, Spark Birds, gave the anthology its title. Emily's books are the American Book Award winning Searching for Zion and the critically acclaimed novel, The Professor's Daughter. Her book, Lessons for Survival, is forthcoming from Henry Holt in 2024. Emily is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and her writing has recently appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, New York Magazine, and The Nation. And it's been anthologized in Best American Science Writing, Best American Travel Writing, and elsewhere. I am also very proud to say that Emily is a contributing editor for Orion. Moderating the conversation today is Jennifer Bogo, Audubon's Vice President of Content. In this role, Jennifer also serves as Editor-in-Chief of the quarterly Audubon Magazine. Toward the end of the conversation today, she'll be taking questions from all of you. So please make sure to drop your questions in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. So with that, Thanks again, everyone, for being here. And Jennifer, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, Audubon is delighted to partner with Orion on the release of Sparkbird, which features so many incredibly talented contributors. And we're especially happy to give our audience the opportunity to hear from two of my personal favorites firsthand. As Amy mentioned, I'm also the editor-in-chief of Audubon Magazine, and I think of Audubon Magazine and Orion as kindred spirits in the publishing world. 
as we both invite readers to think more deeply about nature and our relationship to it. And as an organization, Audubon likewise believes in the power of literature and the arts to help inspire more people, and in particular, to inspire them to take action to protect birds in the places they need. So I've been reading Spark Bird since I received it, and it's so well named, I must say. The poems, essays, and arts really reflect a fascination for birds, and in many cases, the personal journey that follows from that. As Amy mentioned, we've dropped a link in the book to the chat, and you can drop your own questions, which I will be introducing a little later in this talk. Um, so I would like to jump right into conversation with Emily and Elizabeth. So um, Emily, the anthology shares the title of the essay you wrote for Orion, which was entitled Spark Bird. And as you so eloquently put it in your essay, a spark bird is like a first bird love. It's a bird that first inspires um, an appreciation or a curiosity for bird life. And so would you describe for us the experience of discovering your spark bird? Yeah, my my spark bird is a little unorthodox and we could show a picture of it. Um, it's the burrowing owl. And the first time I saw this bird was on 145th street in Harlem. Um, upper Manhattan, where I teach and, and lived and parented. Um, and I saw this burrowing owl, uh, not, not like a real life owl, but, but a rendering of a burrowing, burrowing owl, actually a pair of burrowing owls um, on the street. There they are, uh, 145th Street. I, I I saw this one day I was walking with my kid and I was like, what, 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 what who are these birds? <laughs> Like they're so funny. I, I just, I find them so quizzical and delightful the way real birds are and their heads are tilted toward each other. And they're standing on what looks like a psychedelic rainbow that reminds me of like Pink Floyd album cover or something. And uh, anyway, I noticed, I noticed these birds and, and kind of fell in love with them and took a picture. And then I began noticing a pattern that there were birds all over the neighborhood um, in similar murals. And we'll talk about that project, which is the Audubon mural project, um, a little more, but this was the, these were the first that I noticed and I just found them so delightful and sweet. The Audubon mural project is a little bit like a scavenger hunt through New York city for birds. And so as we mentioned, we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into that scavenger hunt in a while. Um, but Elizabeth, your essay also explored birds through the perspective of art. So would you share with us a little bit about how an art initiative brought birds to life for you? Yeah, I was involved in a a, a project. It was it was titled Eclipse. Um, and that's really what the, the essay is, is really about this um, project. And uh, I will also share an image of that. Um, because I think it was helps to see it. Hold on one sec. Um, it was a project that was projected. So what you're looking at here, you would see unfold over time on the ceiling <clears throat> of a museum, the Mass Mocha Museum in, in North Adams, Massachusetts. And um, it seemed like this enormous, enormous flock of birds uh, was flying overhead. And that was to really give people, this was a, an exhibit to sort of commemorate the 100th anniversary of the death of Martha, who was the last known passenger pigeon who spent her final days at the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, and of course, none of us has ever seen a passenger pigeon and certainly has never seen what was supposedly one of the most spectacular sights, which was this cloud, this vast cloud of passenger pigeons overhead. Um, and so I, the project, the idea of the project was to allow people to, you know, sort of experience that, but sort of in negative, as you see, because the, the birds are white and the sky is black. So it was sort of playing with that, that neg negative space. Um, and it was a long, long, narrow room. And I think it was quite a moving experience. At least I like to think so for the people who saw it. Um, and I love to see it revive somewhere. So if anyone has any any ideas, they should let me know. It, it, unfortunately, it's it's tailored to a, a very long, narrow, and high ceiling. So that essay also included this uh, 
kind of amazing little anecdote about a Shakespearean actor two centuries ago who asked a minister to help him uh, find a way to essentially kind of uh, inter and eulogize his friends who turned out to be a dozen dead passenger pigeons themselves. Um, and it's an amusing anecdote, but there's also this sort of sense of grief running through it. And also I would say through your essay, Emily, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, where does that stem from? And like, how do you, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, like we haven't seen, no one alive has seen these birds. And so what, what is it, how do you adequately capture and even more in birds we've never met through, through writing or through art? Well, I guess I can take that question first. I mean, it's 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 a challenge that everyone, you know, who who writes about the passing of species, which unfortunately is becoming kind of a happening with, you know, horrific um, regularity. Um, there's now even a word for like the last known representative of a species is a lastling. And, uh, you know, I myself have written several sort of obituaries for the last, you know, known creature, uh, you know, snail or species of Hawaiian snail that's now extinct, the last known representative was named George, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of um, stories like that and how one, one does it, how one tries to fight the sort of numbness that I think people feel about these issues um, is, is really, you know, challenging. And I, I, I don't have a sort of a simple answer, I, I think, every person who is trying to, to do this and many artists and many different media are trying to do it in many different ways, you know, comes to it with his or her, their own, you know, take. And that's, you know, part of what makes some of these works, you know, great that they're really original. Um, but I also would say, you know, as I said, as someone who's, you know, sort of written, you know, many of these things now, you know, how, how do you, how do you really break through a certain callus, I think, that people have developed? Well, I'll tackle that question next as a, as a reader and also as a writer and a photographer. So, um, like a lot of people who are in this in this Zoom room, I, I I I've read Elizabeth Colbert's work, and it's made me pay more attention to um, it's made me pay more attention to what we're losing and what we stand to lose. And so I think that pair of burrowing owls that were my spark bird that we showed, um, you know, they're very they're very whimsical. But the reason they're there is that they're endangered and expected, unfortunately, by the year 2080 to, to maybe even be extinct, along with all of the other birds that are part of this mural project that's unfolding in my neighborhood. And so it's true what you said, Jennifer, it's kind of like this delightful scavenger hunt once you realize it's not just one bird mural, it's like over a hundred of them at this point, over 120, I think there's 123 or more. And I made it a personal project to photograph all of them. Uh, in part because I find them delightful and beautiful, but also because I understand it's a it's a project about mourning and about loss. And just as those birds um, stand to become extinct, those murals also aren't going to be around forever. So you know, in a kind of documentary style, it's really important to me to 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 capture um, what I find to be a very sad, project at the same time that it's a beautiful project. And, and I also just wanted to add that, you know, my my spark bird was 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 a piece of art, right? Like made on the gallery of the street for the delight of the people who who enjoyment of the people who live in a neighborhood where also things like habitat loss um, <laughs> due to gentrification and environmental um, issues are 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 compounded and um, affecting the health of those of us who live there in, in similar ways that the, the health of birds is being affected by environmental issues. So I, for me, this, this project and kind of falling into it just because it's part of my surround, but also because I've been affected as a, as a reader um, by work like that of, of Elizabeth Colbert to, to pay attention um, and to amplify uh, these forms of beauty, these forms of life that are, that are threatened and endangered feels like um, uh really crucial one of the one of the hats I actually wear at Audubon is hoping to coordinate the Audubon 
mural project. And um, it's off, it's long struck me that there's there's an impermanence to public art that I think really speaks really well to sort of the environmental mission of the project and also just the effort to make people um, really consider the fate of birds. And Elizabeth, this, this seems true for the art installation you experienced as well, right? Like it's, it's, it's there for a while. It causes you to stop and reflect on it, but then the birds in this art eventually go away. And of course that's, that's where we're trying to seize this moment to, to capture um, some energy and some uh, reflection that will help people sort of like perhaps consider and take action that will kind of forestall um, or or avoid that future. Um, but yeah, it's just public art seems like such a great tool for conservation in that way. And yeah, I mean, there are also public art projects. Some come to mind. I mean, I've seen like a statue of a, you know, giant auk. Uh, I don't know what it was cast in, but it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. So, I mean, people are definitely, uh, you know, taking different tacks. Um, but I do, I do think that the point you raise and that the, the Audubon mural project that Emily writes so eloquently about and the great photos, I mean, I think that there is an interesting resonance there, obviously, with impermanence. Um, but I, I do want to say that some people are taking the opposite, and they, the what they've created will far, far, you know, outlast the actual creatures that are being commemorated. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's something we probably try to do in writing as well, right? Like through Orion and also through Audubon and through you've you've met your share of rare birds, certainly Elizabeth and your reporting. And is there is there something to trying to, to putting them to the page that kind of, do you think about that when you write about rare birds, the sort of lasting sort of record of them it creates? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think, you know, Emily, Emily alluded to this, this, this idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunately almost become a cliche I don't I hate to say that but you know sort of a bearing witness you know we're all we are all witness in a sense to all of these things that are disappearing in our in our current moment very fast you know places um, now people have always you know loss is part of human life but it has the loss of sort of the the natural world has accelerated so much even in you know my own lifetime um, that I think you know, it feels, can start to feel very overwhelming, obviously. Um, but one um, hopes people who, you know, who write for a living continue to hope that um, there is some uh, not, I mean, it, it serves a dual function, you know, I guess you could say that that writing about something that is gone or is going to be gone, where there's really very, very little hope that it's not going to be gone. Um, you are preserving it in some way, you know, some way, um, but you are also, you hope, you know, sparking something in people's minds, you know, that sort of let's not let this happen, keep happening uh, muscle that, you know, people definitely possess. So Emily, you're an accomplished photographer, and so I thought I'd turn turn back to that a moment. And um, there were photographs that accompanied your original essay in Orion. And would you tell us a little bit about the role of photography and how that um, how that affects how you view and experience the murals? And um, I'd like to actually share some of your photos as well. Wonderful. Yeah, as I said, I felt really compelled to photograph all of them as they started landing and appearing, uh, or they as they continued to land and appear in um, Upper Manhattan. And I should say that the reason they're where they are, like you don't see these murals down on Fifth Avenue or Midtown or downtown. They're they're uptown, where uh, John James Audubon used to live. Um, he's buried on One Fifty Fifth Street, and they're a lot of things in our neighborhood that are named after him, including housing projects and the Audubon ballroom where Malcolm X was killed. Um, so like his his kind of footprint is all over the neighborhood and in this fashion, 
um, the, the murals are kind of part of the, his legacy of paying attention, conserving birds. So this one is, I, I really like this one because it's the style is really strange. And I should say each of these murals, almost all of them are painted by a different artist. Some of them are local to the neighborhood and a lot are from outside. Um, this one is the Tundra Swan. And I'm really glad I photographed it because it's no longer there. The mural it was tagged over by like another graffiti artist. So um, we were talking about the ephemeral nature of public art and also the ephemeral nature of these birds that are um, becoming extinct. So so later I went to um, coastal Alaska to write another piece. And um, this is where the tundra swan is. I knew I, I knew about the tundra swan like because I'd seen it in Harlem. <laughs> Um, before I went to the Arctic. This is the roseate spoonbill. Um, it was important to me in photographing these birds to also capture a person um, and also to capture this commercial signage above the bird because I'm interested in the the way those things uh, interrelate and, and kind of clash um, as these carpet and tile, tile and linoleum. This one is on Broadway. A lot of them are along the, the corridor of Broadway. Um, this is the, how do you say it, Jenny? Is this a uh, Jera Falcon? Gear Falcon? <laughs> yes. I don't know how you pronounce it. <laughs> a Jera Falcon, so. Yeah, that one's gone too. It's no longer there by the Broadway Gourmets Alley. Whenever they call it gourmet, it's like, it means like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I loved about this particular mural, it was one of my favorites, is that it extends onto an ice box. Right. Yeah. It spills over like that. It's not just two dimensional. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it seems like, um, like it's approaching your own dimension when you, when you walk past it. Although, like I said, this one is gone too. Yeah. And gyropalkins are so um, dependent on the Arctic as their habitat. And this is a great example of a bird that um, really is emblematic of some of the challenges of global warming because it's already really far north and so as it loses its breeding grounds as it's projected to it really has nowhere else to go it's already really far north but a lot of these um a lot of these species too that we're showing I'll just note also um if people actually if we were able to actually limit warming to one and a half degrees instead of three the prognosis for a lot of these birds um is dramatically better. It, it reduces some of those losses in half. Um, but yes, the Jira Falcon has been painted over, and I, I can't, I can't remember exactly what is there now. But it's, I think it has like dollar signs on it, and it's just sort of like a funny juxtaposition of this Jira Falcon, then went on to become this sort of like more, you know, commercial reflection. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Western Tanager outside of a dental office. Um, I love how brightly colored that one is. This is the Wilson's Warbler. The, yeah, this is actually, you can't see the signage, but this is a storefront church. Um, and did I have any others? Yeah. Oh, this is my very favorite one. That's the Great Gray Owl, uh, also on Broadway. This one's been defaced a little bit too it's it's changed since I photographed it um maybe you could go back to the yeah. trumpeter the trumpeter swan sure. down here yeah this one's a little different because it as you see it's um it's a mosaic it's made with with tile like salvaged tile um bits of ceramic and it was made collectively uh, in the spring of, well, was it maybe the summer of 2020? Um, it, was, yeah. it, it was installed in the fall of 2020. All right. Yeah. Dur during it. So it wasn't like the height of the pandemic, but we were still in that moment in upper Manhattan. We, you know, we suffered like um, an inordinate loss um, with COVID-19 and this was a kind of a beautiful coming together of the community of making this, this piece together. Uh, that's the trumpeter, the trumpeter swan. And it's, 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 yeah, like I said, it's artistically different from the other ones in that it's not really a, a mural. It's not a painted mural, but. Yeah, this one was a real sort of participatory piece when it went up and a lot of people sort of, I think, commented that they were able to 
um, both connect with the natural world through this mural and connect with each other at this very sort of like dark time. For yeah. Me. That's how it felt. Um, so as, as you've, as we've discussed, climate change is something you've reported on so extensively, Elizabeth, um, how do you, you've touched on a little bit, how do you um, convey the complexity and urgency of the crisis in a way that people can also like feel they have some agency in it? As I noted, if, we get, if we're able to limit warming, it, it has real impacts for a lot of species, but the um, it can be so, the cold science can be so overwhelming. Well, you know, I've been struggling <laughs> with precisely that problem for the last 20 years. Um, and once again, I don't, I, I clearly don't have the answer, otherwise we wouldn't be in the huge mess we're in and we would have done something about this. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's on some level, it's not a unique problem. You know, the question of, of you know, depressing global problems about which one has little agency, but one still feels one needs to do what one can, you know, that's kind of maybe the um, situation we're in with all modern problems has that. Um, but I think that it is absolutely crucial and what is increasingly crucial as the damage, you know, mounts and as we're really seeing this, I mean, this, this past year has been just, you know, off the charts, crazily warm and brought just absolutely, you know, a, a foretaste of, of what's ahead and, and, and real, you know, terrible disasters all around the world. Um, you know, most recently the hurricane, well, no, not even, the hurricane has already been overtaken. The hurricane in Acapulco is already overtaken by a very ferocious storm in uh, Europe that killed uh, at least a dozen people. And dumped like, you know, a month's worth of rain on parts of Tuscany in like three hours. So, you know, every, basically every other day, you know, you could find some unprecedented disaster occurring. Um, but all that being said, the, the, you know, you can't, one of the important things about climate change, one of the really dangerous things about climate change is you can't unwind the clock. I mean, you can't, it's very, you know, once, once you're at a certain level of warming, it's, very, very difficult. I'm going to say virtually impossible to sort of set back that clock. And that increases the urgency of preventing, you know, even more warming. Now, you know, I, you can say this, I can say this, I've been saying this, people more, you know, knowledgeable and powerful than I have, have been saying this for, you know, now we're really going on, you know, 40 years. Um, and it doesn't seem to make a great deal of, of difference, you know, that that is the um, truth of the matter. We're, we're still headed globally and in a very bad direction. I'm interested in how you maintain your own, and this is really for both of you, how you maintain your own resilience in the face of grappling with this through just lived experience and through your writing. And Emily, I think maybe even your forthcoming book touches on themes of resilience. And so I, I'm just interested. It's something we we also think about as magazine editors who write about birds and bird conservation every day. Um, well, for the book that I have coming out in March, which is called Lessons for Survival and, and includes a version of this essay, Spark Birds, with the images um, that, that we've been looking at, uh, it was really important for me to interview and talk to people who live in fence line and frontline communities about resilience. So not always given um, the mic when we're talking about climate mitigation strategies. Um, but I think uh, we can learn a lot from people who have really lived through and are living through this disaster in slow and accelerated ways. Um, people in Puerto Rico have a lot to teach us about community and um, what you do when you're without power after after a hurricane for a really long time. Um, people who've lost their homes, who've had to move. Uh, so I am really interested in learning resilience from, from, from but th that extends to other species. I didn't write about it in that way, but I think it's really um, important to look at resilience, not just in the human, human, human population who are moving through this catastrophe, but, um, but also, but also other species. 
Um, and I'll remind everyone to, if you'd like to ask questions, um, we will kind of open it up to audience questions soon. So feel free to drop those in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I'd like to take a minute to kind of shift shift the conversation towards another theme that I think runs really strongly through many of the essays in Spark Bird, which is um, Bird's ability, their kind of somewhat unique ability to pique our curiosity and really extend our imagination. Um, that's a place we love to meet people at Audubon Magazine. We love to sort of meet them in their joy and celebration of birds and, and their, their moments throughout the book where different writers sort of reflect on what it, what uh, what it looks like, the ex what what else they're noticing is they're looking for a great owl's nest or gazing upon sort of a, a ring that had been banded from a bird that they discovered. Um, so I'm curious, um, what have you, how have you experienced that either in real life or even through great writing, through the experience of writing? And how do you try to elicit, are there ways that you try to elicit that in your own, in your own writing? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, looking at the world, obviously, one of, you know, one of the great, and I, 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 I should confess to not being a birder per se, um, but, uh, you know, looking at the world through, through the eyes of another species, which is really, you know, in a way what birders are trying to do, I imagine, and where do you find birds, how do you find birds, except by sort of thinking, what, where, where will they be, what will they want, what do they want, what do they need, um, you know, that's a, a crucial activity. And, you know, people have, have obviously always done it. You know, we, we spent many, many tens of thousands of years um, relying on our, our skills of finding other animals, you know, to survive. So you could argue it's a really, really um, deep uh, human, um, you know, instinct or, or talent. Um, but I think nowadays, you know, it obviously takes on you know, a, a different form as many of us are not, you know, dependent on our skills to find animals or to see the world through their eyes. And it, it has much more of a, um, a, a thoughtful, you know, component. You have to really uh, want, want to do it. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm not sure where, where, where I'm taking this, to be honest, but I think that 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 exercise, which honestly could be done, you know, with a grasshopper if you wanted to, but they're just not as um, cuddly or seemingly as friendly, uh, is is one of the great, you know, sort of challenges of our time and everything that we do. Uh, you know, I just mentioned my one of my own, you know, pet peeves. I guess I was just walking. To, I walk a lot. I hike a lot, and I was, you know, noticing everyone getting rid of the leaves in their yard, you know, uh, in this time of year, which, um, you know, is a lot of creatures need those leaves, you know, the leaf cover, they, they evolved to live over winter in the leaf cover. And so we really, you know, for so many reasons, which include, you know, practical ecological ones, we really need to spend a lot more time, um, a lot more energy thinking about the world through other creatures, uh, senses, not even necessarily eyes. Emily, you've you've identified yourself as, and I, and I do want to take a moment to pause and say that Elizabeth, we're we're kind of trying to, I guess, take back the definition of birder and make clear that it's people who enjoy birds and appreciate birds. So I think you have legitimate, <laughs> okay. legitimate claim to an honorary birder. birder. Okay. Yes, <laughs> if that yeah, that changes how you how you view yourself. Um, so Emily, you've, you've identified yourself as an urban bird watcher, and I'm curious, what are some of the things that you um, are looking for as you, you know, navigate the city? What are some of the things that have stuck with you? Well, I think those, those, those bird murals really made me more alert and aware since I was paying such keen attention to those bird murals and continue to pay keen attention to them because they, they keep showing up. Um, they made me more aware of actual birds <laughs> to the art that I that I maybe started to become a, a birder in the loose terms you're you're describing it. Um, mm -hmm. I guess like Elizabeth, I, 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 I felt I feel like my my birder creds are not very strong. I'm not one of these people who you who you see out in the woods with binoculars or even in Central Park. <laughs> 
But, um, you know, something happened to a lot of us in New York, those of us who stayed in the city during during the pandemic, during lockdown, where um, that height of the pandemic spring 2020 coincided with with the Atlantic Flyway, with the migration of, of birds making their their spring migration. And uh, and I think because we were so bored and so terrified and so um, in 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 despair a lot of us became more aware of birds and interested in, in, in birding and learning their names and delighting in their songs. And, you know, for us, like in upper Manhattan, um, the topography is such like, uh, on the, in the Western portion of Washington Heights, there's we're up like on a cliff, you know, like on a bluff overlooking the Hudson river, there's just, um, a lot of, like red-tailed hawks or even peregrine falcons, like amazing birds of prey to watch. And those are particularly interesting for, for my kids. So like there's this added layer of, you know, we're talking about paying attention and maybe, you know, being being in love with the world in an extra um, attuned way through bir through birds. Then there's this added layer when you get to see your kids taking delight in them and teaching them the names of these birds and observing the you know what they're doing so close to us and all around us all the time um and i think we have a video of of my kid and his buddy you know watching a a red tail hawk <laughs> through the window they often um will perch on like the 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 buildings around in the surround but they'll also perch on right outside the window on like the air conditioners or or like the the infrastructure that's there to hold the air conditioner um do we have that video the ability yeah, to show that video yeah. I, I would love to show that share that Let's see. um my screen share what i like about this this video that jenny's queuing up is you get to see just the delight of children in this awesome awesome creature what's happening here as you can see, mm -hmm. eating a pigeon in New yep. York City <laughs> on the windowsill of our neighbor. <laughs> oh, look, you can see a bone. So, right what do you think, oh, you guys? It's so cool. cool. Geronimo, what do you think about that? Talk about this. Where's the bowl? Ew. God. He better eat that whole thing, or he better remove it. <laughs> Whatever he doesn't it eat. It is so cool. <laughs> he needs to take with him. Geronimo, what, what do you observe about that hawk? I don't see any, um... Look at its leg. Look at its feet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're watching yeah. a hawk. Oh, sorry. I mean, that that sense of, like, wonder and, and joy and curiosity and amazement that you get to see <laughs> these, these kids having being so proximate being so up close to a bird just doing its thing um you know I think that's I think that's that's what we're talking about <laughs> this love this love of birds is wanting to just yeah pay attention pay attention and feel really like blessed to be in their company yeah um I have two kids too and it is so interesting to me to watch the way they sort of navigate wildlife in the city and what that looks like. They, um, and they, I think they do sort of form their own relationships with it. Like there's this particular frog in Prospect Park that they go check on when they go um, to Prospect Park. And, um, and that actually makes me think a little bit about birds like Martha, right? Who is the last passenger pigeon who we've kind of like formed this, we've, I guess, ascribed this relationship status to this, this last bird that was a member of its species. It's a pretty, Know, it's an interesting impulse for for people I think to relate to to nature in the natural world so I'm going to take some questions thank you for dropping them into the chat um one uh one maybe natural question coming from a lot of our climate change talk is um can you provide encouraging stories of successful bird protection or habitat restoration what are some of the more sort of like uplifting things maybe that have stuck with you well i mean i it's the obvious one and it's not a it's not a climate change story but it's it's obviously the return of the um of the bald eagle, which, um, you know, I, I, 
now live in a part of the world where you pretty regularly see bald eagles. You never used to see them before. Um, that's an amazing success story. Um, you know, obviously having to do with banning DDT and, you know, which was really devastating for, for a lot of, a lot of birds in, in the U S um, and now they've really shown, I mean, speak about resilience, they've really shown, you know, their resilience and are really coming back and to see an eagle overhead, to see an eagle's nest um, is, is an amazing sight that, you know, as recently as I'd say 10 or 20 years ago, you pretty rarely saw here in New England. So that's an incredible success story that shows you, you know, if, if you can identify the stressor on a on, on a bird, on, I mean, I'm sure this obviously is, in, you know, goes for all taxa and you can remove that stressor, then you can accomplish amazing things. And I think, you know, the problem with climate change and the reason it is is such a scary one is because it's, it, it's, it's inescapable. And you know, you were talking about birds, you know, tundra birds who cannot move north, but in, in general, it's, you know, it's really hard for all creatures who have to move, not only, you know, they have to move in concert with their prey, if they're predators, they have to move in concert with their vegetation, if they're herbivores. So, you know, that coordinated um, migration, which, you know, which will happen for some creatures, but you can see that there'd be a lot of sort of collateral damages as even creatures who themselves have the ability to migrate don't necessarily migrate with all that they, with all that they need big thing for birds who are obviously very mobile. And I'd just like to add to that, like a, a kind of parallel six small scale success story, the, um, the, the mural that you shared, Jenny of the Wilson's warbler, um, where the man is kind of walking what looks like through a flock of yellow, like yellow birds on the storefront of a, of a, of a church is right near this um, really important local activist community center called We Act for, for Community Justice. And um, uh, they've been really successful, you know, just as these birds are endangered, like a lot of people, including the kids who you saw in that video have asthma because of poisoning infrastructure in our, in our neighborhoods, bus depots, dirty boilers, um, wastewater, sewage plants, um, were encircled by highways and so breathing the fumes in in ways that are disproportionate to to the rest of the community. And so um, what I really like as a small sale scale success is uh, this organization managed in a particular housing project in the Bronx to trade out everybody's um, stove, everybody's like like the stove that had a burner like for an electric, um, stove and and why that's important is that it makes the air quality better in the homes of the people who live there. Um, and so I just want to just want to add when we're thinking about conservation, thinking about um, not just birds, but people who are who are living in toxic communities as well. Yeah, I think that's something we're learning to um a connection we're maybe increasingly learning to draw. We've always felt sort of connected to nature, but really this idea that our fates are also so intertwined with the actions that we that we take um, in terms of our environmental health. Um, and I'll just point out also um, to, uh, to tag on to Elizabeth's story that this year is the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act and the Endangered Species Act made a huge difference for bald eagles and a lot of other species. And so the, the history of sort of the act uh, is super interesting as is what, how it itself, you know, is going to adapt to the changes ahead because things like climate change weren't really on the radar when landmark legislation like that was, was first formed. Um, another question um, to maybe to pull it back from sort of political and more global action to personal action are, what do you, do you have any, do you both have any advice and sort of personal actions people might take to address climate change or, or environmental issues around them? Well, you know, that's always a, um, a complicated question, to be honest. I mean, we all do 
you know, trail along a cloud of carbon um, emissions that, you know, based on our activities, um, you know, the big one in, in it's for different people can be very different. Um, you know, if you um, travel a lot, you know, fly, flying is way up there. Um, if you don't, you know, then probably your your biggest emissions may come from from your house and what you what you buy, everything you buy travels a cloud of carbon. So calculating these things, you know, can be can be can be difficult. Um, and you know, there's one school of thought that says, you know, we shouldn't be focusing on our own, you know, individual actions. We really need systemic change. And I certainly certainly agree that we need systemic change. There's there's clearly no way we're dealing with this problem without that. But I do think, you know, people should be mindful. And often our instincts are pretty poor guides to what are, you know, really big carbon. There was just a study that came out, you know, what people think is really a big emitter, you know, like, you know, recycling and things like that, which actually have, a, unfortunately, a relatively trivial part of your carbon footprint, um, something like taking a flight, you know, to Europe is a, is a really big carbon emitter, unfortunately. Eating meat is a big carbon emitter, uh, you know, heating your heating and air conditioning, driving, those are big emitting activities. I've been inspired by the ideas of um, climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, who says one of the biggest things we can do um, to combat the climate crisis is to talk about it. Um, because there's a wide gap, there remains a wide gap, although it's starting to close between those of us who are really appropriately afraid and those of us who speak about it um, with any degree of regularity or even at all. And so um, that gap is referred to as climate silence. And the reason why um, Dr. Hayhoe argues that that uh, we need to to close that gap is so that our, our policymakers know what matters to us. Emily, may I ask how you talk about that this topic with your with your own kids? Do you have advice for um for I guess clo closing the climate silence gap within within sort of generations? Yeah, I I I am interested in generational justice and in being frank with them about what they are inheriting and what we're in the middle of now. It's not a future eventuality, like we're here enmeshed in the problem and they can see it and they know they know about it. My children are now age 10 and 12 and how I talk about it with them is different from how I talked about it with them when they were um, five and seven or you know three and five. And it, it often derives from the questions that they're asking me, um, which often come about because they're observing and things and hearing things and noticing things and are 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 afraid. Um, so I kind of handle it by uh, trying to talk honestly with them, but taking taking my cue from what they want to know, um, and also trying to be solutions oriented uh, in ter in terms of what what can we do. I mean, I. I like them to know what careers are available for them in the green sector, for example, um, things like that. We've gotten some questions, um, no doubt, uh, given your your uh, talents and the topic at hand about books and what books you're reading, what books you would recommend uh, that touch on sort of either birds or these sort of themes of like the natural world. Well, there, I mean, there's so many um, great books, a book that I really like that I don't know that it's gotten the attention that it deserves. So I'll throw it out, out there is um, it's a book called The Forest Unseen by David George Haskell. And he just looks at a very small patch a forest over a year and he's he's a biologist and has so he sort of reflects on what he's seeing and also it's 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 informative and very nicely written and birds you know fly in and out of this particular um patch although i would not say it is you know specifically a a, a bird-centric book mm -hmm. um 
that book, the way you've described it, reminds me of a book that I recently read and really enjoyed, which is Camille Dungy's book, um, Soil, uh, A Black Mother's Garden, which takes a similar idea, like I'm going to spend a year really paying keen attention to this little plot of land. And in her case, it's her backyard, which she's um, which she's uh, converting from from a like a lawn, a suburban lawn into like a native pollinating um, what she calls a prairie. And um, it's really meditative and beautiful and also political. Um, one of the themes that uh, I guess maybe one of the scientific projects that's perhaps trying to seize on some hope in in the sort of realm of all of these extinctions is actually de-extinction. And Elizabeth, we received a question, no doubt for you, on what your thoughts are on de-extinction. And is that, is that a reason for hope, perhaps? Uh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I think I will be frank, I guess, and say I think it's pretty um, much of a distraction from what's going on. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, there are so many, and there was actually, you know, sort of briefly this, you know, flurry of, there's always a flurry of news around something's going to happen. We're going to, for example, you know, the passenger pigeon, we're going to take a, you know, a rock pigeon, I think is the closest relative, maybe, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly which pigeon is the closest relative, but we're going to, and we're going to, you know, reverse engineer. We do have passenger pigeon DNA from a lot of preserved passenger pigeons. We now have amazing capacities for sequencing that DNA um, and we'll just like tweak you know at many different spots I mean we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of um, you know genetic changes that you'd have to make um, but you know on the one hand there are the technical hurdles which once again I, I've alluded to already but I won't go into the details but let's just say it's not easy um, I mean we're talking about uh, you know, making many, many, many genetic changes at once to to a creature. And those are just not easy to affect and to actually affect them so that the creature is actually viable. Um, and then once you had a creature, let's say you had something that was, you know, sort of a passenger pigeon, you know, passenger pigeons had a way of life. Um, and that way of life in their case involved having, you know, many millions of them in these huge flocks. And if you were somehow managed to create a couple of them, you know, what do you, what do you have? And the same is true. You know, there's some nice talk of, well, we're going to reverse engineer a mammoth, which is actually, you know, fairly closely related to an Asian elephant. Um, and, you know, you know, a mammoth undertaking to use a bad pun, but um, even if you got something that sort of resembled a mammoth, had some of the genetic changes of a mammoth, because you can never, you know, be sure that you've even gotten all of them, owing to the um, complexities of, of paleogenetics, um, you know, you, you don't have a tundra for them to live on anymore, you don't, you don't have that. Um, so where are you going to put them? You know, some people have talked about putting them in Siberia, which is a really interesting idea. So these are all really interesting ideas. And I think that, you know, maybe they spark people's imagination. So maybe they're good in that way. But I personally do not expect to see, you know, in my lifetime or, you know, any of the lifetimes of any of us attending this today, uh, a creature that's successfully been brought back from extinction, um, you know, all the way and the amazing genetic things are happening you know um cloning and trying to introduce genetics into gene pools even if the uh creature is no longer with us i mean that's been done with a with some ferret black-footed ferret uh, dna that was very well preserved so amazing things are happening but i i don't think um you know, this is way, this, this problem is way, way too big to be dealt with by, you know, going through that kind of process. And there's, there's so much attention um, and focus really placed on threatened and endangered birds, but very common birds are also facing a lot of yeah. 
common birds in steep decline. Yeah, it's a frightening, frightening phrase to even mention. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, no one has a totally good answer, you know, as far as I know for why that's happening, but we can have some pretty good candidates. And and one of the candidates is that insects are crashing. And once your insect populations are crashing, then obviously everything that depends on them, and that includes, you know, a lot of birds, obviously. So that's a very um scary one. We should be really scared when common birds are in steep decline. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's so much fascinating science too, where people are trying to now look into some of these questions around what there, some of those declines are very mysterious. And so scientists are trying to understand what, what exactly is driving the decline of these birds that, that seem in many respects ubiquitous. Um, I'd like to, we, we're going to need to close it up pretty soon, but I, I thought maybe, maybe we could end it on that note. So like, We've gotten a couple of questions in the Audubon Mural Project that I will take, but I would like to come back to the common bird themes for you two at the end. So if you wanna give a, a minute of thought to um, perhaps the role of common birds in people's lives as it relates to sort of the world that we're trying to navigate together as you know animals living on this planet and maybe your own relationship to common birds. So that the Audubon Mural Project to answer a couple of the questions. If you go to Audubon's website, there is a page devoted to it. It has a map. Um, you can look up where the, mur the murals are. You can see which murals are still out there. We don't plan to, there have been murals that have disappeared over time. We don't plan to repaint those. To our earlier point about impermanence, those birds have, um, the building has changed hands, they've been tagged over, but we are populating new birds throughout the city. And then one thing we've seen are, is people are starting to carry that concept to other cities and other communities, which is exciting to, from the perspective of, I think, opening conversations in new places, an opportunity to open a conversation about your local birds and climate change and really kind of cause people to stop in the streets and maybe think about the birds that go unnoticed around them. Um, but Elizabeth and Emily, we're gonna we're gonna have to end soon. So are there any last reflections that you'd like to offer? Um, well, I guess I'll just offer one last reflection on the theme of common birds, uh, which is I, I, I live with a lot of crows, probably a lot of people in this audience live with a lot of crows who are, um, you know, really, really fascinating. And the more we learn about crows, the more, you know, brilliant we, we learn that they are um, under perhaps underappreciated uh, common birds um, that who, who deserve um, more affection. I guess, you know, being in New York, the, the common bird that comes to mind is a pigeon, maybe an underappreciated bird as well. But when you consider, you know, what Elizabeth was sharing about that art project that she wrote about for this anthology, the possibility of something people just took for granted, right? That passenger pigeons who would blacken the skies because their population was so immense were gone within a couple of a few generations. I mean, it's just astonishing how something you you imagine will always be there could be gone. And uh and just, I mean, when you think about things that are common, I think, okay, we can't take something for granted just because we see a lot of it, you know, um, because it's part of our, our our normal surround doesn't mean that it will always be. I mean, to me, I can't I can't imagine New York without pigeon without pigeons. Um, yeah, yeah, and that maybe also speaks to the great adaptability of species too, if we just give them a opportunity. Yeah. So I, that is a lovely note to end on. So I just want to thank you both for joining us in conversation. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, we appreciate, appreciate you and your writing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and there's a lot of great, um, I'll make one more plug. There's a lot, a lot of great writing in here, not, not uh, that we didn't get to, but a lot of um, really wonderful writing including poems and art also yeah. all right so go find the link to spark birds and enjoy your reading bye everyone <laughs>